Baklava wearing a balaclava while playing a balalaika on black lava. Quite a mouthful and very strange, but a great example of an alliteration joke related to the topic of this video. When we think of the balaclava, we think of cold weather, skiing, combat units, or people wishing to conceal their identities, whether they be special forces, paramilitary groups, or even terrorists. However, where did it come from? What's with the name? Well, let's find out. Being that the balaclava isn't a specific item that's only seen usage in a handful of instances or by select world militaries, this video is going to be similar to the Ushanka video in that it will be more of an origin of, covering the topic in a more general sense. So that being said, where do we start? Well, the idea of wearing garments to protect one's head and face from cold temperatures and the elements is not a new one. Throughout history, numerous styles of hats and headwear have been used and range widely depending on the culture and part of the world. However, the idea of wearing something of a tight, almost form-fitting piece such as the balaclava wasn't really seen all that much. There are technically two starting points, one in 1854 and another one which starts much earlier with an item referred to as either the Ulan or sometimes Templar cap. Now the Ulans were originally Polish-Lithuanian light cavalry first seen around the early 1700s. Their overall look and style would be utilized and adopted by a number of other European nations until as late as World War II. They often wore a very distinct cap that would be referred to under the umbrella term of kapska, meaning cap in Belarusian and Polish. An early offshoot of the Shako, this cap clearly bears no resemblance to the Ulan cap, so why was it referred to as such? Well, the answer may lie in why it's also known by the name of the Templar cap. Now, not a whole lot is known regarding the origin of the name. However, one good hypothesis comes down to a garment that was either very similar or the exact same, known to many by another more common name. As early as the 900s, headwear known as coifs were utilized by numerous individuals, specifically warriors, with the primary purpose to provide a layer of padding when wearing larger headgear such as helmets that rested upon or covered the entire head, these quickly expanded in both style and use. Be they thin and light, thick and padded, or made of chainmail, they were worn by warriors of all kinds, from the foot soldier to full-fledged knights of numerous kingdoms, militaries, and orders, the Knights Templar being one of the most affluent and and recognizable. These initial iterations often covered the wearer's entire head, neck, and sometimes even the shoulders, leaving just the face exposed. As time progressed, coifs would evolve and alter, finding their way into popular use for things such as fashion, to more practical purposes such as protecting the head from the elements. They would shrink in size and see the means of securing them change too, with versions for women being frequently adorned with additional designs, fabric, and lace. As the centuries continued on, they would be seen less and less until they inevitably would fall out of fashion in the 1600s, being really only used by select individuals such as nuns and as padded items for soldiers. So it's a safe assumption a descendant of this piece found its way into the hands of Ulan forces at some point, either alone or with their recognizable cap, and, much like the Templar cap, the name just stuck. It's also worth noting that during the Battle of Balaclava and throughout the Siege of Sevastopol, a number of British light cavalry units had uniforms directly inspired by Ulan forces, much like many other European nations at that time. Because of this, the Balaclava caps, which as we've said have also been referred to as Ulan caps, likely found their way into their hands at some point during the winter and gained the nomenclature of Ulan cap. Now, this is all just speculation as a lot of the information just isn't fully there. But what is known is that the Crimean War helped update this cap and begin its journey into the mainstream, which brings us back to the name, Balaclava. The start of all this comes during the Siege of Sevastopol, which was a near year-long period of the larger Crimean War that saw Russia take on the Ottoman Empire and its larger allies France, Great Britain, and Sardinia, over who was considered protectors of the Christians in the Holy Land, that being the area between the Mediterranean and Jordan River. The Balaclava's namesake comes from a small town outside of the city of Sevastopol. It was here one of the most famous instances of the war occurred, but before we get to that, let's cover the reason for its creation. The Crimean War was fought between 1853 and 1856. However, French and British forces did not become majorly involved until September of 1854 when they landed a large force in western Crimea. With the fall coming to an end along with plans for a siege of the largest city in the region, Sevastopol, troops were in for a long and cold winter. Now, the Battle of Balaclava itself happened on October 24th of that year and is most known for the charge 
charge of the Light Brigade. The confused and failed attempt by British cavalry to try and stop Russian forces from securing and taking larger naval guns during their retreat. Though the battle was a disaster for British forces, most of the area, including Balaclava, remained in their control. Come the winter time, they would face another challenge, the elements and logistical problems most notably a lack of winter uniforms and equipment. In a somewhat funny twist, the winter back in Britain was actually colder than it was in the region around Balaclava. But the main issue was that most forces stationed in and around the town did not have adequate clothing, as the ones requisitioned for the winter were done so in August. With such short notice, the uniforms were slow to arrive and the ones that did faced delays unloading and issuing due to distribution problems mainly caused by a failure in command. There was even one case of a ship, the HMS Prince, sinking with a large quantity of winter supplies still on board during a storm in mid-November. This meant quite a few soldiers in the camps, trenches, and other fortifications around the area had to continue to wear most of the same clothing they arrived with months prior. It wasn't long until the public back in Britain got word about the failure to properly equip their troops, which in turn caused a bit of controversy that inevitably led to a public outcry. This resulted in many members of the public knitting face masks and other winter clothing which were then sent over for their troops. That, mixed with some proactive and inventive officers, led to the commissariat sending a large quantity of hoods which offered protection for the head, ears, and neck. This essentially was the first instance of the modern-day balaclava and would catch on among troops around the area who would also begin to fashion their own. They helped provide a decent level of protection and over the next few decades seemed to be sporadically used with one of the first instances of it being referred to as the balaclava helmet being seen in 1881. Due to the British getting involved in the First Boer War, also known as the Transvaal Rebellion, flaring up around this time. It was here that British forces in southern Africa would have to deal with scorching daytime temperatures, but also freezing ones at night, which resulted in the use of cold weather gear such as the balaclava. From there, they'd slowly become more prevalent in use by both the public and various armed forces, but their first use on a massive scale didn't come until World War I. It was here soldiers faced all sorts of weather, adverse conditions in the trenches, and of course, many times, a shortage of supplies and equipment. So to help out, the Red Cross adopted a similar approach done by the British populace during the Crimean War, by encouraging people to show their support through knitting all sorts of desperately needed items from socks and gloves to hats and balaclavas. Posters and other propaganda were created telling of how anyone could help by creating one of the three designs which were referred to as helmet models A, B, and C. Be it in France, the US, Australia, and other places beyond, anyone and everyone who could knit, and even those who couldn't, could get their hands on approved designs and material to create all sorts of wearables. Fast forward to the Second World War and balaclavas were often issued to a variety of units on both sides of the conflict. They were most commonly used by forces operating in colder areas such as as the Arctic, at sea, and oftentimes up in the air. Because of the different types of operations these forces conducted, a variety of different versions were seen. Though the most commonly used one was still the design that featured a full face cutout, which could be adjusted to cover the lower face, a number of less common and even new designs were seen. A few examples were one that could be tucked into uniforms that allowed for a full seal between the torso and head. These had also been seen in the First World War. A shorter, more easier to put on and take off design, which featured a small visor, ones that featured ear cutouts to allow headphones usually worn by pilots and other aircraft personnel, ones that could double as scarfs, and ones which featured a flap that could be secured by buttons. These ones were developed by the Soviets and appeared almost as standalone hoods one could find nowadays on many forms of your average winter coat. After the war, it seems that face coverings of all sorts began being used by military forces, be they closer to the traditional balaclavas or more peculiar and specific designs. However, it was the post-war world that changed the balaclava into its more modern appearance everyone knows today. Not only would the design be refined and altered as far as its shapes, materials, and colors, but its uses would evolve as well. Where it was originally intended to protect the head and face, it would now be also used to conceal one's identity. This would be taking advantage of users on all sides of the law as well as ideologies, and would help birth the most common and widely known version we see today. 
Some examples of groups using the balaclava for this purpose were the Irish Republican Army, or IRA, during the 1970s and onwards, in the era that would become known as the Troubles, members of the ETA separatist group, which resided inside the Basque region, which is made up of parts of southwestern France and northern Spain, numerous special weapons and assault tactics, or SWAT teams, operating throughout the United States, various Chechen militant and rebel groups in the Caucasus, officers of the People's Armed Police of China, and members of the Sin Sinaloa and Knights Templar drug cartels, among numerous others, who operate throughout Southern and Central America, as well as Mexico. Now on the surface, the idea of hiding one's identity to prevent personal repercussions makes sense on a small scale. It wasn't long for the same principle to be quickly adopted for larger ones too. On a grand scale, balaclavas were and continue to be used by numerous groups and countries to sow confusion and prevent opposing forces from being able to properly gain intelligence on them. The most famous example of this is the idea of maskerovka, meaning something masked or disguised in Russian. This doctrine has been around since at least World War II, with others arguing much longer. The main idea behind it can be summed up with three words denial, deception, and disinformation, with the overall concept being that through incorporating these practices into tactics, forces, be they military, economic, or political, can obtain almost any goal. Usually these are large scale, but they frequently can boil down to the smallest factors, in this case wearing balaclavas. One of the best and most recently seen instances of this came in 2014 when Russia annexed Crimea during the early stages of the Russo-Ukrainian War. Look at that, we're back in Crimea. It was there numerous troops dubbed Little Green Men appeared wearing mostly modern Russian uniforms and camouflage, all of which was devoid of badging and identification. They all utilized balaclavas, essentially concealing their full identities as they moved into the region. Initially, Russia denied they were their troops, but by mid-April they were confirmed by Putin and state media outlets as such. Today, though, the balaclava continues to be worn on a global scale. Easily accessible and cheap, these pieces of headgear have permeated into almost all facets of life. Be it skiers, snowboarders, firefighters, race car drivers, soldiers and other armed forces, police and security personnel, stereotypical bank robbers, terrorists, militant and other radical groups, and the occasional rap artist. The balaclava has become a staple to many and world recognizable because of its simple yet highly effective design and usage. And that'll about do it for this video. If you enjoyed or learned something new, consider subscribing along with hitting the bell to be notified when we upload in the future. If you'd rather not and keep yourself concealed, that's absolutely fine. Just be sure to periodically check back for more videos right here on Uniform History.